Tour, you revitalize students, staff, alumni, and community alike. Welcome back to another exhilarating episode of How We Have It. My name is Michael Sir Powell, and this week we will be discussing the importance of sleep and how a good sleep routine can positively affect your mental and physical well being. Today, we've chosen an award winning international PhD research student who has a wealth of knowledge in sleep psychology and good sleep practices. She is the chair of Insomnia and Sleep Health for the Australian Sleep Association, the peak scientific body in Australia and New Zealand. On campus, you can find our subject tirelessly researching in the RMIT Sleep Lab. It sounds like she has her dream job. I am very excited to unveil from her quilt covers after counting multiple sheep, our special guest for this week's episode, Prerna Vorma. Prerna, welcome to you. Firstly, did you have a good night's sleep? Yeah, I did, but I did wake up really early, so you might see effects of sleep loss on me. <laughs> Oh, that is okay. You are looking revitalized in your very fresh background there. Now, <laughs> Pruna, tell us about your research at RMIT and what actually inspired you to look more deeply into the psychology of sleep? I'll talk about RMIT Sleep Lab first because it's where I work. So it's basically this multifaceted sleep lab where we look at different aspects of sleep disorders and how it affects your mental health, your cognitive functioning, as well as your physical health. So we have heaps of research projects on things like dementia, shift workers, having insomnia, being an undergrad student with sleep loss or experiencing sleep deprivation and so on. It's quite interdisciplinary. We also look at different treatments for sleep problems. Now, the reason I got into sleep was because I love sleep. <laughs> Who doesn't? So when I had this opportunity of getting into a project that looked at sleep from a more family perspective, so looking at how parents, children are sleeping or how it sort of affects each other, I was like, grab that opportunity because you want to learn more about sleep. That is quite amazing. And Purna, you wrote a terrific article last year about the way sleep deprivation affects your brain and your body. Could you tell us what happens when someone is sleep deprived? But yeah, you know how you have like this assignment deadline and you're like, okay, I want to sleep, but at the same time, I want to do my assignment in some ways, like it's not going to do it itself. And that's when you kind of need to realize that sleep deprivation and even a single night of sleep deprivation can have three different kinds of effects. So it can have cognitive effect on you, which is basically when you have reduced ability to finish your assignment, you'll be like, why am I even doing this assignment in the first place, you know? So that's the cognitive aspect. You might experience a little bit of memory loss where you don't remember what you were supposed to do. Not as severe as on several nights of sleep deprivation. But then you also have physical effects in the sense that you might experience changes in your appetite or if you want to like snack more because you're trying to finish your assignment. And also mental aspects where you might feel a bit more annoyed, a little bit more irritated or groggy if you're sleep deprived. You might also experience what's called micro sleep. So it's like an involuntary mechanism where your body puts you into that sleep state all on its own and you don't have any control over it. So that also happens if you're really sleep deprived. So the next time you see yourself nodding off while you're watching TV or sitting somewhere, just know that it's probably because you're sleep deprived. Now, Peruna, what are some of the health risks associated with sleep deprivation? Well, first of all, you have the obvious physical health risks. So things like risk of high blood pressure, heart disease, um, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and several other chronic medical conditions. Then you have changes in your appetite, increased risk of heart attacks and strokes if you're um, someone in the more older or middle age group. Having sleep deprivation for longer duration can affect what's a brain structure called amygdala, which might actually make you more annoyed and irritable. And at the same time, it might affect how you perceive other people. So if you're chronically sleep deprived and someone comes and asks you, can you do this thing for me? You're going to see why are you threatening me? Are you forcing me to do this thing? So it's like you actually perceive faces as threatening if you're chronically sleep deprived. But apart from that, you can also have mental health effects um, because of chronic sleep deprivation. So people who experience severe sleep loss can be more at risk of things like depression or anxiety. And of course, overall sleep deprivation in itself is linked to lower life expectancy. So they're pretty damaging physical effects that you can have from several nights or from from long-term sleep deprivation. Wow, that is a lot of reasons right there to get a good night's sleep. What does the term sleep hygiene mean and why is it so important, Frenna? 
Sleep hygiene is this term that's used for practices that can help you with sleep. So sleep hygiene usually involves things like making sure that you're sleeping at a regular time every day, waking up at a regular time every day. So it shouldn't be like I'm going to sleep at 12 o'clock tonight and then I go to sleep at two o'clock the next night. So just making sure that you have regular bedtimes and wake times, just making sure that you avoid any kind of stimulants before you go to sleep. So things like having coffee, um, I would say avoid having caffeine after four o'clock in the afternoon just to make sure that you can sleep properly or even things like making sure that you don't exercise too close to your bedtime that your bedroom is only used for sleep and sex and not other activities like watching netflix i like watching netflix in bed but you shouldn't be doing that so sleep hygiene practices basically involve any practice that you can do to improve your sleep or ensure that you have good night of sleep and i'm guessing no little glasses of baileys before going off to bed either Probably not. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, the thing about having a nightcap is even though it can help you fall asleep really quickly, it actually deteriorates your sleep quality. And that's the reason why if you consume alcohol or any kind of alcoholic substance, it's going to make you get up feeling groggy or you might have eight hours of sleep but still not feel refreshed. So I wouldn't recommend doing that. <laughs> With sleeping pills, does the person need to see a health professional before getting sleep pills or do you recommend other methods rather than going straight to that certain option? If what you're experiencing is insomnia, which is either difficulty falling asleep, early morning awakening or midnight awakening and so on, I wouldn't recommend sleeping pills in the first case. So the first line of action would be a therapy called cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, which is like this really interesting therapy that has been seen to help with insomnia or sleeplessness. But if you do have any other sleep disturbances, always consult a healthcare practitioner first, ask your GP what kind of medications you can take and especially how long you can take them because not all of them are safe for long term. Brilliant. Are there any resources for people who are struggling with insomnia at RMIT? Yeah, so currently there is a Sleep Health Foundation, which is basically this Australia-based foundation, which gives a lot of resources around different kinds of sleep conditions, what you can do, what kind of resources you can try. So I would recommend going on their website, sleephealthfoundation.org.au. Well, that is fantastic to hear that sleep hygiene can help people get a good night's sleep. Now, what are some ways that students can help improve their sleep and how do you practice good sleep hygiene? One of which I found really useful is having a wind down time. It involves not using your phone or watching TV at least half an hour before going to bed. Just looking at your phone and that scrolling, it's just going to keep your mind really alert. I would say avoid using your phones and have that wind down time. Optimize your bedroom. Just make sure that it's nice and cool because your temperature increases slightly when you go to sleep. And the other thing that I would recommend is getting a good amount of sunlight in the morning. So like sitting by the window might be a good option. Going out for walks when it's quite sunny outside is a good option to improve your sleep. Yeah. One of the big questions for all the students out there, and I'm very curious about this one as well, is how much sleep should students be aiming to get a night? And what is your advice to those students doing all-nighters to finish their assignments? Yeah, well, firstly, don't take all-nighters to finish your assignment. Now you know that pulling an all-nighter means that you can't really concentrate on your actual assignment. You can't really stay alert, so it's not going to help you to actually submit it. In general, you need about seven to nine hours of sleep every night. Some people very rarely need more or a little bit less, but seven to nine is a good average to take. My other suggestions would be to sort of have a schedule in terms of like what you're going to do each week or having a Word document where you keep on jotting down your points with the assignment so that you can do it quickly rather than pulling an all-nighter. And of course, look after your body because if you're not going to sleep, you're not really going to do well on your assignment. So yeah, don't pull an all-nighter. For all those elite athletes, professional sport players or exercise enthusiasts out there, does the amount of movement throughout the day dictate the amount of sleep you get? And is there a recommended sleep time for these certain situations? So one of the best ways to improve your sleep is actually to get some exercise, except that the exercise should not be too close to your bedtime because what's that going to do is it's going to tire you, but it's not going to make you feel sleepy because you have that adrenaline rush after exercise and you feel more awake. So have exercise probably in the morning, early evening, not too close to the bedtime. A good thing to look forward to here is understanding how your body clock works. So your body clock is basically a circadian rhythm, which works on the light and dark 
o'clock cycle. So when you get up in the morning, it's like, okay, I have to stay awake. And when you go to the night, it's like, okay, I have to sleep. Some people are more morning people. That is when they feel more awake and more alert. And that's when they should be exercising for optimal sleep. But if you're more of an evening person who's like, I feel more energetic at like eight o'clock in the night, you should be exercising early evening to actually promote your sleep. So work around your body clock. Don't overtrain, but definitely get some exercise. Finally, Pruna, today I am happy to announce we have a brand new segment for this week's episode called Snooze Busters. Mm -mm -mm. I love it. Hell yeah. <laughs> I ain't afraid of no sleep. Okay, anyway. Our first question for Snooze Busters today, Pruna, is counting sheep is an effective method for falling asleep. Not really. It can help some people to calm down, but it doesn't really help you with sleep. If it did, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> That's very true. Is it healthy to nap during the day? Yes and no. So there's been a lot of studies around some cultures where people actually go and take naps and then fall asleep pretty quickly. So my general recommendation is if you have to take naps, take them early in the afternoon for no more than 30 minutes. And if you see that it's impairing your sleep quality or if it's stopping you from falling asleep at night, I would recommend not taking naps. Now for all of our Mediterranean viewers out there, siestas and weddings, where you go to a wedding, you eat a lot of food, you go to sleep and then you come back for the next course. Is that a healthy way of getting in some naps? <laughs> I don't really know what to say. That's a really fun one. The idea of like eating and going to sleep, but probably not the healthiest option. Make sure that there's a little bit of gap between when you eat and when you sleep. That's actually going to improve your sleep quality again. Otherwise, if you're too full, it might impair your sleep quality and you won't feel as rested. If you want all of that energy for the dance floor later at the reception at the wedding, make sure you leave that gap in between eating and sleeping. You heard it first here on Healthy Habits. Turning up the radio, opening the windows, keeping your eyes open with matches, burning yourself with a cigarette lighter is an effective and pain-free way to stay awake when driving. Hmm. I would say if you have to do any of these, you should probably stop your car and not drive. Now, remember how I talked about micro sleeps? Micro sleep is involuntary. And if you're really sleep deprived to the point that you have to practice one of these activities, that's probably a good indicator that you shouldn't be driving. Drowsy driving is the leading cause of accidents in Australia. So avoid any situation where you're driving drowsy. The first step is making sure that you take a good amount of sleep. If you feel drowsy or sleepy, don't drive your car. Or if you feel sleepy when you're driving, just like park somewhere and get a short nap. So I would say don't practice any of these, get a good night of sleep or get a nap in between if you feel drowsy and you still have to drive. Very good advice there, Pruna. Just because Mr. Bean got away with doing it doesn't mean you're going to be able to as well. He is immortal. <laughs> <laughs> he, well, is. he is. <laughs> Now, is it important to decipher and record our dreams? Now, I have a dream diary here. I probably haven't filled it in as much as I should, but is it important to do something like this? Well, I mean, I record my dreams when they're food related so that I can say something along the lines of, I had a dream, that's an indication that I need to eat that food. But in general, it's not important to record or decipher your dreams. But if this is something that you really enjoy doing and you like the idea of journaling, this might be a good activity to do. Now. Your dreams usually happen in what's called REM state of sleep, which is where your body is nice and relaxed, but your brain is actively working. Your neurons are firing and they're trying to create a narrative of the day you've had. So you don't necessarily need to decipher it. It can be a good activity to do and to know what kind of dreams you're getting. And for all those screenplay writers out there as well, if you have an incredible dream, you might be able to turn it into a movie one day. That's true. I know that you're talking about Inception. And who knows, you might get Leonardo DiCaprio in your dreams. Ooh, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> How can you get a good sleep on a plane or in any moving vehicle? I need to know the answer for this, Bruna. Well, I've noticed that there are some strategies that can help. Just making sure that you feel a little bit calm. So anything that makes you feel calm could be things like 
meditation again. Neck pillows have increased my sleep quality on planes by so much, like at least by 50 times because I couldn't sleep without them before. Wearing good clothes like cotton fabric and so on so that you don't feel too restricted. Having a neck pillow or anything else that makes you feel comfortable. And at the same time, just stop putting effort into it. Like just stop the expectation that you're going to sleep okay on a plane. Because what happens usually is when you expect too much, you put more effort into sleep and sleep just eludes you in some ways. And also have like this little bit of a buffer where you're like, okay, if I don't fall asleep in the vehicle or if I don't get good sleep on the plane, do I have some time to go back to a hotel or a house where I can sleep a little bit? Well, you heard it here first. You don't have to buy a first class ticket in order to get a good night's sleep on a plane or a moving vehicle. That's such an expensive price to pay for a good night's sleep. I would pay it though if I had the money. And Pruna, where can our refreshed viewers find you if they have any further questions about the topics we discussed today? I'm active on Twitter and you can follow me on Twitter. It's called sleep underscore psyched. So like I'm psyched about sleep. And Pruna, is there a final message you'd like to leave with our viewers before bedtime today? Just make sure that you have consistent bedtime. I know that it's COVID-19 and a lot of people have been experiencing um, difficulties with sleep. So make sure that you follow resources that I've provided in this chat and make sure that you connect with your friends and your family and attend your classes and don't put all-nighters for your assignments. No all-nighters, okay? No. no caffeine before bed and no all-nighters. Keep yourself nice and healthy. Thank you for your time today, Pruna. Stay safe, happy, and healthy during this period of time. And if you appear in our dreams tonight, we can decipher that as a good omen. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Michael. And yes, record dreams if you like it. That is right. Remember, you can find all of our new episodes of Healthy Habits via the RMIT Sports website, also at RMIT Sports for our Instagram page, and be sure to click the subscribe button on our YouTube page as well. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week on Healthy Habits, and have a good night's sleep.